Greetings and welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight at Space Cowboy Books Online. I'm your host, Jean-Paul Garnier, and tonight we are here with Howard V. Henricks to celebrate his latest collection of speculative poetry, Living Fossils Are the Happiest Kind. <laughs> Howard V. Hendricks is an award-winning writer of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. Hendricks's first four published novels appeared from Ace Books, Light Paths, Standing Wave, Better Angels, and Empty Cities of the Full Moon. His fifth novel, The Labyrinth and Key, appeared from Ballantine Del Rey, as did his sixth novel, Spears of God. His most recent collection of shorter fiction is The Girl with Kaleidoscope, The Girls with Kaleidoscope Eyes, and Other Analog Stories for a Digital Age. He's the author of several novelette chapbooks and over 50 short stories, the latter collected in six short story collections between 1990 and 2014. His numerous poems include many pieces in Starline, as well as the SFPA's Dwarf Stars 2010 winner, Bumper Shoot, and Extravehicular Activity, which appeared in the April 23 issue of Scientific American. He is also the author of many political essays, book reviews, and works of literary criticism. His book-length nonfiction includes The Ecstasy of Catastrophe, Reliable Rain with Stuart Straw, and several, book, and several works on which he served as co-editor. Visions of Mars with George Schlesser and Eric Rabkin, Bridges of Science Fiction with Gregory Benford, Gary Westfall and Joseph D. Miller, Science Fiction and the Dismal Science with Gary Westfall, Gregory Benford, and Jonathan Alexander, a past Western Regional Director and Vice President of SIFWA. He is a recurring guest editorial writer for Analog, Science Fiction, and Fact, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Hendricks also taught writing and literature for many years at the California State University of Fresno. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome, Howard. Um, so we're going to do it a little different tonight. We're going to intersperse some poetry with the interview. If anyone has any questions during the event, please feel free to throw them in the chat and we will attempt to get to them all. So, Howard, in Living Fossils Are the Happiest Kind, uh, the poems in the book were written over a span of many years, but all come across as a very cohesive collection. Do you find yourself gravitating towards certain themes and subjects in your writing? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, the, the, there was some selecting of the material uh, that I put in there. And uh, um, I guess I, I tend to, a pretty consistent theme is the natural world and the human impact on it. And that goes way back. And if I may, I'd like to read a couple of sort of bookend poems that illustrate that. Uh, one of them is very early. This one uh, goes back to 1994. The earliest poem in the collection is 1987. The most recent is 2023. So let me see if I can find this one. And this one's kind of important to the name of the collection. Uh, Living fossils are the happiest kind, which is not just a joke line, but it's it's quite serious. and. There are a number of poems that deal with extinction and that deal with living fossils. So first one I'm going to read to you is called Ginkgo. It appeared in Asimov's back in 1994. Ginkgo, your leaves fall 220 million years ago, fans of endearing maidens pressed between pages of coal. Beneath your boughs strut the lucky dragons but no bone shadows record the color of crushed dreams in their eyes when their fortunes change. You grow weary, dwindle towards sleep until the awakening priests come to plant you in the pure land of their temple gardens that those who may not eat meat may eat of you. Men of science snatch you from the temple precincts, a new geisha to join their harems. Coelacanth and Nautilus and platypus and you, the most hopeful fossils, are those still living. Out of love, we plant you beside our stone roads to inhale our burning smoke, to exhale your sweet air. You are patient, so patient you do not worry who will love you after we are gone. Ta-da! Thank you, I see, I see claps in the world. Very good. And it's uh, it just a couple a quick thing or two here. It's great to see some of my new friends from Colorado and a lot of my old friend, friends from California. 
And it's great to see you out there. Thank you very much. And the other poem, which is the other bookend of this, was uh, one that appeared in Scientific American uh, in 2023. And as I've said a number of times, I was really happy to have a poem in Scientific American. That just blew me away. I just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. So I was re really happy to have that. So that poem is, it's called Extravehicular Activity. Excuse me as I shuffle pages. Uh, extravehicular activity. Let us stand outside our spacecraft long enough at height high enough to see Earth breathing its seasons, to feel its pulses across years, the rise and fall of global indices, vegetation, water vapor, total rainfall, snow cover, land surface temperature, net radiation, sea surface temperature, inhale, influx, diastole, exhale, efflux, systole. Is this macro of our microcosm running a temperature, pulse growing more erratic, breathing more shallow? How are we feeling? How long can we stand outside our spacecraft? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. So I just want to get it started with that. Um, and your your question was about do certain themes, do I come back to certain themes? And yeah, uh, if if you read the collection, there is a lot of, you know, there's the, the, I mean, the, the way the future is haunted from the past, by the past. And so there's references, strange sort of offbeat references to Eden and uh, to the fall um, and all of those tend to, to file back into um, this sort of our, our relationship with the natural world. So there you go. You want me to read some other stuff or do you have some questions? Uh, sure, of course, we'd love to hear more. But I, I do have a question. As someone <clears throat> whose poetic output ha has spanned many decades, have you found your concerns or your approach to writing poetry change over time? Yeah, it has. Um and one of the things that's happened is I've become much more interested in in very short poems. I, I you know, sort of micro poems. Um, and the reason I like those is because, oddly enough, the more I strip them down, the more I constrain what I'm doing. Paradoxically, the more it seems to open up space for readers. And that 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 sort of blew me away. I'm still doing, and I, I'll do, still do weird stuff. I mean, I one of the poems in the collection, uh, which was published in Starline, by the way, um, feathered, feathered, feathered eclipse of the sun, uh, is essentially the poems made out of six haiku. Uh, I, I've gotten very very intrigued by that form, and because uh, it's very it, surprisingly, you know, it's going to be five seven five. It's going to do all this, but it. Uh, it really frees me up. It helps me to sort of graph different ideas and mesh ideas together and have to do it in a very, very short period of time. Would you mind sharing a few of those sci-fi coup with us now? Sure. Um, okay. All right. Let me see what I can find here. Just looking over my list well to give you a sense of how different poems can be and how they are their uses the uses of haiku can be different um let me go here page 28 okay for, i'll do feathered eclipse of the sun uh as as one as one example and then i'm gonna back it up with a poem that is hopefully a little less serious. So this is called Feathered Eclipse of the Sun. It is made out of six haikus. Um, and there's it has an epigraph. Clouds of birds that could block out the sky for hours or even days. That's the epigraph. Our language was song until you taught us to speak. Curse your cursing us, uplifting our minds until they soared with your wings and ungrateful us, demanding return of dodos, pigeons past count, 
to flock with life's brood. Museums give back our dinosaur ancestors' bones we claim for ours. Universities, unstuff your fat collections. Let them fly your coops. Let feathered eclipse top eclipse of the feathered with murmuration. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to give you one that's a little bit more upbeat, I know that some of the folks who saw my readings in San Francisco have heard a couple of these. Um, let me see if I can find something appropriate here. Okay. Um, no, 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 that's not good. That's not right. Excuse me while I search again. Okay, here it is, page 21. Notice how it's supposed to be so well organized. I've got all these little tags on the end. They just went out the window. So I'm just doing things. All right, let's see, 21. Okay. Oh, and this is this is a I hope a lighter a lighter hearted piece. It's it's the it is a, a haiku that actually has a title. Thirty five billion any given day. Poultry numbers mean when the planet eater comes, Earth tastes like chicken. So there you go. I always want to do that. Just have to have a little fun. Um, and there, there there's such a wide variety of things that you can do. Uh, not only with with poetry, uh, but also with very very constraining forms of it too. You know, I said sometimes when people say, you know, why write poetry? Um, because poetry is like all other forms of writing, only more so. Um, and that's I, I really like that sort of power to weight ratio to be able to try to tighten it down. It's always something I've struggled with in my prose. Um, I can be rather prolix, and poetry constrains me from doing that, and it's very helpful. Any other questions? Absolutely, I've got tons. Um, okay. So I'm a big fan of sci-fi coup as well, particularly humorous sci-fi coup. <clears throat> and the book features a, a good number of sci-fi coup. You've also been a Dwarf Stars winner uh, in the past. So what are some of your favorite things about short form poetry? And what concepts do you reach for when distilling ideas for, for micro poetry? Okay, um, and distilling is a good word. Um, not because I'm drinking, but, but it's a good word uh, because it. Uh, I like to be able, as I said before, to bounce ideas right up next to each other very quickly, uh, and try to and that and yet let a le uh, leave a space out there for uh, readers. And I I find that it lends its sci-fi cube works really well because the the scientific and science fictional themes and it can be woven braided in to the the rest of what you're trying to do poetically and i i just love that i just love that it, it's it's another dimension to what i what i was doing trying what i'm trying to do in a piece so i could try to do you want to hear, hear some more sci-fi coup uh let's see i've got a fair number of those in here um oh and this one's kind of self-deprecatingly comic uh, this, this is called Such Skill at Putting. Such skill at putting this foot in my mouth makes this tongue fit for a shoe. And that's all it is. That's all it is. It's just a little quick, quick thing. And you know, there are just so many opportunities. You know, it, I, that one, uh, but here, here's one. It's uh, actually, I, for, for a while, I was doing a number of haikus that were combining uh, haikus and quantum physics. And actually, oddly enough, a number of the pieces in here came at, out in Asimov's. But uh, I've never pub I've published all kinds of stuff in analog, never a poem. But in the May-April issue, there is a haiku in analog uh, called, uh, I can either remember the first line of it. Um, can't do the whole thing. It's under contract. Um, is love that alter is love that alters is love that alters yes that's the first line of it is love that alters and it's about you know, it's about quantum entanglement so fun 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 uh, but you'll have to read that in analog I, it has not been published yet and they have full tentacle grip on it so there you go but it, it, it's wonderful to do that sort of thing I've got one here too and it's sort of a broken uh, 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 quantum 
line and it's under the the title split pairs of Ghana and it goes split pairs of Ghana hawking singularity center cannot hold and you could actually do a whole thing on hawking radiation out of that but I didn't so there you go that, that's fun I, I I love doing that I love having the science the scientific level in it um just one and these are new these are pieces that haven't appeared yet oh new stuff okay to give you some examples of that um this this one's called elongated clouds of rc amons and rc amons on 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 mars it, it generates these strange elongated clouds almost every day that last only for a few hours that's really cool so uh, it goes like this orographic lift mountain boosting clouds by their ballerina hips okay so i like i like that you know little high art mashed up against a little science um love messing around with uh busting well with that from this an analog it's a it's basically mixing quantum mechanics and lines from shakespeare which is a lot of fun uh i, I love doing that it's a, it just makes life more interesting and there's also here one here um called irony for living fossils no sooner are they discovered than endangered cryptids gone legit and i, I that really does <laughs> there you go it it does get to me though that's so bizarre um i've been doing a lot of research on living fossils and lost worlds and last humans and what's intriguing about the whole there's this weird sort of uh continuum between cryptids and what eventually is recorded in the scientific literature and we think about it, Thomas Jefferson was a cryptid freak okay he was convinced there were still mammoths and mastodons in the vastness of the American West so one of the things he told Lewis and Clark to do was find them for me they didn't but they found lots of other interesting stuff so so it, that that I'm glad you liked that I saw Cliff enjoyed that which was good um so how do I get oh, out here? Well, I'll get I'll get back. Um, but yeah, it's so I've been doing some research on that, and it just amazes me. And there, there's some tragedy and irony that uh, uh, pop up uh, in this in the whole situation we're in with the collapse of biodiversity. Actually, there's a really good poem in uh, not by me. Uh, in the most recent issue of Star Wars by Gavin Kaner, I think his name is. And it's a really interesting poem about population and, and biodiversity collapse. I'm like, I like that stuff. So there you go. So ask me another question. Uh, so we've got one from the audience here. This one's from Cliff. Um, yeah. do, you, do you see sci-fi coup as being related to flash fiction? Yeah, uh, actually, yes. And it's weird. Maybe my brain is just decaying with age. But I'm writing a lot more uh, both sci-fi coup and flash fiction. Um, yeah, it, it's it it's it's wonderful to play in that space. And yes, I do see them as related because again, really good flash flash fiction that isn't just a, a slice of life stuff. It really has a plot. I want plot. Okay, to do that in a thousand words, say, is a real challenge. But it's a good challenge. Uh, it's it's a way to work on my craft a bit, and uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, they are related. Uh, they the constraints of the form force you to really just sculpt it down, really sculpt it down and back. And I highly recommend that. You know, I've written six novels and uh, lots of novelettes and novellas, uh, but there are things about Flash that. Uh, and that uh, and sci-fi coup that it's just that I hate to say it that quick hit okay uh, for the audience and for the writer um, I I've gotten to the point now where I'm writing haiku a couple of haiku every day and a lot of them are junk okay but uh, I I really love working on them because they're like a mental exercise you know some people count sheep when they can't sleep I count syllables okay so it's kind of weird um but i i I'm, I'm having a great time with it great time with it and the fact that it's finding an audience uh is wonderful and i, I must admit for years i've been threatening 
to to uh, to bring out a collection. There is a show the book, uh, bring out a, a collection, but I never did. And then suddenly, la last uh, about a year and a, half, a couple of years ago now, um, Deva Sobel, who is the was is the poetry editor at Scientific American, accepted a piece of mine. It was the, my fourth submission, and uh, she accepted a piece. And she said, "Well, you know, we're backed up, we're backlogged. It's going to take a, a couple of years for the poem to appear. So if you want to pull it and publish it somewhere else, and I no." To have a poem in Scientific American, I will wait. And it, it, it gave me a lot of confidence just seeing that. And it pushed me to put together this. And it, uh, it, it was it's actually published out of Australia because I'm quirky. And also because uh, I happened to see a really a, a very good review of a book that was published by this publisher. The name of the publisher is In Case of Emergency Press. And their symbol is a little red button. Okay. Um, and so I thought, okay, cool. Uh, I liked, I liked what I, I'd seen the book that they brought out. And I thought, what the hell? You know, Australia's got plenty of living fossils. Here you go. And they bought it. And it was a really nice experience. And the cover actually has ginkgo leaves on it. So they actually read my stuff. So there you go. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's it. Any, any other questions? I, I find I, I agree with you with the sci-fi coup and flash. There's an immediacy um, that, that's that's really good. And, and a lot of the work in this book um, has a very immediate feel, which I, I appreciate that that heavy hitting. So um, we're echoing echo chamber. I'm not sure what there. Yeah, please stay muted, uh, everyone in the audience. Um, so this is sort of a very broad sweeping question, but why speculative poetry? Why did you gravitate towards this in the first place? And um, do you ever write non-genre poetry? Yes, I do write non-genre poetry. There's a little bit of it in here. My challenge is, though, that every time I try to start doing uh, non-genre poetry, genre keeps creeping into it. Okay. I'm going to give you an example of that. Um, okay. I'll give you one that's, that's not a haiku, uh, but... It, it, it this one was uh, I had hoped would just be sort of straightforward, uh, you know, not. not well, well, let me give you some examples of what I would consider are uh, are a non-genre. There's a couple of them in here. Um, now, let me get find this here for you. One's a haiku, and one's another poem. Uh, so fairly short, but not that short. Um, okay. 31. Yeah, this is, a, this is a haiku, and it's a very traditional haiku. It's called in tall, it's in tall Grass Dying. In Tall Grass Dying, Crickets Lament Worlds Undone, Autumn Even Song. And that's, that's really standard stuff. The only thing that might turn into a science fiction aspect is world picks up, puts up its head and I have to slap it down. But it, it's a very traditional poem. Um, in terms of the haiku, you know, natural scene. It's, and that's one of the other things that uh, intrigues me about haikus is they inherently work with, you know, human human responses to nature. But although I, in the next, there's another poem here, and I'll get to the one I was talking about. This one is one where I obviously went science on, science -y on it. Um, this is another haiku. It's called White Noise Snow Blinded. White Noise Snow Blinded. Digital man still finds death without GPS. Happy poem, can't you tell? Okay, but the other one I was gonna do for you that is pretty pretty close to being just, being non-genre, um, but the, most of the rest of them, as I said, the, the genre stuff creeps in. Um, I can't help it. I really like adding that extra layer. It's a lot of fun. Okay, let me tall grass thing. It's 31. Okay, I already did that one. Unseen good old man. Let's see. This is one my wife's uh, aunt really liked. And she said she appreciated because of her age. Um, and I understand that. I've been going that way. Aren't we all? Let's see. It is called the Unseen Good Old Man, which is actually a, a line 
uh, from Shakespeare's Hamlet in reference to the death of Polonius, um, who, spoiler, Hamlet killed behind the heiress. Okay. The unseen good old man. The older I get, the smaller the stride I make until one day I shall walk with the shuffling gait of someone feeling foot by foot the way through a darkened house, anxious not to stub a toe on death or trip on the bottom step of heaven. There you go. And that's a pretty straight, there's not that much genre stuff in there, but I'll give you examples of when a straight poem goes into another world. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Yeah, okay. This is on page 47 in the collection. There are about 70 poems in this book, by the way. Okay, this is called, and this is very much a Southern California poem, and I know that, okay. Memories of Asteroids Near JPL. From shining mountains, Santa Ana winds, stampede down canyon. Eucalyptus writhe, Italian cypress bow, palm fronds rattle and shake. Cars swerve as tumbleweeds big as escape pods bound across freeways. Dodging twig bag asteroids, I am for a moment a valiant starship captain, daring and escaping collision and certain doom again. Oh, that was fun. And, but it, it starts out very much localized in Southern California and then it goes into space, you know? So that was, that's a lot of fun. One other piece uh, in terms of the, the sneaking in stuff, if I'm thinking about it. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is called Hakusai's Great Wave. I'm sure many of you know this piece. Uh, it's one of a series of images of Mount Fuji uh, by Hokusai. And it's it's wonderful. The, the, I've got a, you know, I'm a very <laughs> uh, simple person in a lot of ways. I have a refrigerator magnet that's an image of Hakusai's great wave. It's a wonderful piece. And it's so very fractal. You know, the, the way the wave breaks is so very fractal. And in the back, you have Mount Fuji. And then you've got the poor schmucks who are, you know, trying to row their boat in the midst of this giant wave. Okay, so, but um, this was one that could have gone just straight, but went genre to Hakusai's great wave, oak limbed branch and twig with snow, fractal synchrony. Okay, so there you go. I once heard uh, 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 Jung's idea of synchronicity described as fractal synchrony. And so I thought that's why I stuck that in there because the two reminded me so much. And actually this goes back to an oak tree on the property that we had in the mountains that burned in the creek fire and where my house was, our house was. And when the snow would come in, it would limb, L-I-M-N, all the limbs with this, just this thin snow. And it would, it would uh, just chart out fractally the way the branches looked outlined in snow. And I'll never forget that image. And that's what, in, that's what sponsored that poem. Any other questions? So, I sound like a teacher again. I taught for 40 years. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> there are many questions, and I think we're going to get to all of them, too. Um, so you're also a writer of fiction. You, you've written mm -hmm. a lot of novels. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when do you reach for poetry versus fiction to tell your stories and why? And do you find one form to be stronger than the other at conveying certain types of ideas? Yeah, I, well, that's a, that's a multiple warhead question. Jean Paul, but yeah, um, yeah, I, I reach for uh, poetry when I want to say an awful lot in a few words and just leave things open for people, as I've said before. 
Uh, and there's something that is, as I said all, earlier as well, the quick hit. Uh, there's something very rewarding about uh, writing uh, poetry. Uh, I, it, you can sculpt an entire idea in a, a very short time, really get a chance to work with it. The French refer to writing novels as the long breath, okay? And uh, in a way, writing uh, poetry, although this, I don't know if this analogy completely works, uh, but writing poetry, uh, especially shorter poetry, and haiku um, is like a sprint. You got to put all this stuff into it, make it all work, but it goes very quickly. With a novel, you're marathoning. You're you're just you know trying to draw this whole thing together. And there's there is the one overlap I would see between the way I do haiku and the way I think of novels of writing novels is that the idea of interlacement that we interlace ideas. Um, and in in a novel, you have multiple plot lines. I love playing with multiple plot lines. In uh, in a haiku, especially, but in all my poems, I want to bounce ideas against each other or weave them together, but much more quickly, you know, much more quickly. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing a scarf, not a tapestry in those, those cases, but scarves can be beautiful too. And I love them. So other questions? So, um, and this question is about a specific poem. And, and if you don't mind, if you'd indulge me in, in reading this, this was my sure. favorite piece uh, in the book. Um, it, and my take on this might be wrong, so correct me if, if the question doesn't make sense here. Um, in the poem Hemispheres and Atmospheres, um, mm -hmm. you speak about something that I think about a lot, about language being an abstraction that can kind of blind the subject. Mm -hmm. um, a, as a writer of poetry, how do you navigate this problem? Well, to realize that, yes, what you have in your head will never be realized on the page. But you try to get it as close to that as possible. Um, and, well, I should read the poem because then people will see why you thought that, why you gave that reading of the poem. So, hemispheres and atmospheres. Okay, page 22. All right. Okay. Hemispheres and atmospheres. The sunlit side of the brain chews into grammar the howl rising from the moonlit side of the mind. With the first drops of that dark storm's rain, puffs of dust leaped from parched tongue. Language is the dry shadow, third eye eclipsed by invisible hand, when for all my words cannot say, I stand in the way. Uh, and yeah, that, that is part of what it's about. And I'm, also playing with a couple of ideas, you know, the whole notion of right brain, left brain stuff. And there's still value to that, although it's not as simple as it was originally put forward. Um, and the notion of, of the storm of the mind and the storm of the atmosphere. Um, and and the, the fact that language is this thing, uh, that when that howl comes from the moonlit side of the mind, the, something leaps up from that parched tongue, but it's never exactly what was in your head. Um, language is the dry shadow, third eye eclipsed by invisible hand. I, I, I like that line, third eye eclipsed by invisible hand, because it mixes, you know, a wonderful old mystical idea with a phrase from economics. I love it. I love doing that stuff, right? Invisible hand. Yeah, invisible hand. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. Uh, yeah, John Paul, that's what I. I'm trying to talk about here, the the and that is the challenge of writing poetry. It is, as I said earlier, poetry is like all other forms of writing, only more so. Okay, and I think that that's always the challenge. Uh, language is always inadequate, but it's the best tool we've got, and so that's that's why I wrote that poem. That help? Indeed, and and that brings up another thing I think about a lot is. Um... Poetry's relation to mathematics and and how they're sort of different sides of the same coin mm -hmm. uh, as far as the pursuit of the truth goes um, and, and just uh, as the, the structure of the work. Um, do you find, I mean, obviously in, in form poem like sci-fi coup, you know, 575 five and counting mm -hmm. syllables, do, um, 
Do you ever use other mathematical principles in, sure. in your work? Sure, sure, sure. It, these are questions that work out really well for me. Um, and I don't know whether this, this poem ultimately works as hard as I want it, I want it to, because uh, I always want to make them work hard. Yeah, but this is a, uh, a poem called Copula for Mathematicians, uh, page 46. Come on. Okay. Copula in for mathematicians. And the subtitle is 12 in fives and sevens. Okay. Not that stands for ought, ought not to fall for, ought that stands for not. Yet because love, a number that stands for nothing, divided by a concept that stands for everything, still counts for something. The universe is barely chaperone distance enough to keep zero space between zero and infinity. That hurts my head, even when I read it, and I wrote it a long time ago. But yeah, it's it's very mathematically based. It's a 12-line piece, and all the lines are five or seven uh, syllables all the way through. And it is, uh, and um, the distance between zero and infinity, it's, I am always fascinated by the, the 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 strange quirky relationship between zero and infin infinity you know this becomes infinite as it, it, it as it approaches zero or this becomes zero as it approaches infinity and that that sort of stuff just blows me away um so yeah i can't i i i would probably have ended up being a biologist i did my undergraduate in biology but i probably would have ended up going on in biology if i were better at mathematics but I still love playing with the stuff. I really do. Um, and yeah, I, my my poems do tend to be mathematically informed in terms of the meter, et cetera. Not always. Um, let me let me read you the one that won the Dwarf Stars many years ago, uh, back in 2010. Um, it's called Bumbershoot. Night. A gun blue umbrella tricked with distant suns and planets is not to be opened indoors. More bad luck or worse. Hold it to the mind's sky. Finger the trigger in its handle. A meteor bullets the firmament. The universe falls shut with a whoosh. Shake the drops of the stars from the loose skin of the darkness. Think of nothing for which to wish. Step into a different house. Now, I, part of that poem is probably a suicide meditation, but it doesn't go that way as, as far as it might. So, and, you know, and some of them, so it, it, I mentioned earlier that um, I, I'm, I'm influenced by a lot of old biblical ideas too. Uh, and there's a poem I have called, that it's a good fit with this, called Babel Before Babel. Um, this is back on, and this also ties into the whole, and what I, again, what I like to try to do is, as I said, interweave things. And so uh, even though it takes its title from uh, a biblical event, it is dealing with something a little bit, a little bit different. Babel before Babel, and it's on page 16. Babel before Babel. The zoo animals endlessly screech, roar, howl, bray, bellow, bay, I am my keeper's brother. I am my keeper's brother. But the bane of tongues keeps the keeper from understanding a sin more ancient than Cain's. And that's the inability of our, us to communicate with other creatures on this planet and see that they've got perception and perspective and their own way of understanding the universe. So that's called Babel before Babel. Um, the whole and again, that's another one of your language problems there, Jean Paul. Um, you know, and that's a that's a really great, a really great sort of echoing uh biblical idea. The notion that all humans used to speak one language and then they became so overweening in their desire for heaven uh that the Lord, the Lord, uh prevented them from being able to speak to each other and scattered them. And that's where we are now. That's where we are with language. So anyway, that's that. Other questions?
So outside of speculative poetry, um, you're known as a hard science fiction writer. Um, yeah. And this finds its way into your poetry as well, of course, uh, as you've discussed. How do you keep up with the sciences and how do you integrate them conceptually into your work? Do you have a process okay. for this? Yes. Um, first of all, because I'm an old school uh, print paper guy, I have for many, many, many years, <laughs> I see Neil raising his fingers. Uh, I have many, many years, for many, many years, subscribed to two magazines that I think were very helpful, Scientific American and MIT Technology Review. Those two have always been very, very good for me. And one of the things that is also helpful about uh, the Scientific American, their online branch feeds you a lot of stuff, you know, quick articles, opinions, et cetera. And I'm, I'm always just trying to follow out ideas. Um, so part of my process is that. And uh, and that that is true both for the sci-fi coup and for um, and for my novels uh, and, and, and stories. I'm always trying to find what I think is an idea that uh, uh, that is usually it, it deals with you know highly probable science fiction science you know the old definition of hard SF. Uh, when I was when I was younger, I did not consider myself a hard SF writer. I thought I was too damn literary, um, but once upon a time, uh, I was up in Seattle. I was I was on the Cefwa board at the time, uh, and I was in Seattle for the opening of the Science Fiction Museum. You know, uh, and I was staying in a hotel and taking a shuttle, and one of the other people on that shuttle was Stanley Schmidt. Stan Schmidt who was year for years editor of at analog. And we got to talking as we were uh, shuttling back and forth. And it turned out he lived in the pine forests up the Hudson Valley. And I lived in a pine forest in the mountains. And we sort of struck it off, hit it, hit it off. And he said, why don't you submit something? Why haven't you submitted something to me? I said, I uh, Stan, I'm, I'm not nuts and bolts enough to be a hard SF writer. And he said, don't do, don't try to do my job for me. Let me decide what is or isn't appropriate for the magazine I edit. And I was still leery of it for about a year or two more. I wouldn't submit anything. Good. But then I did, and he bought it, and he kept buying everything I sent him almost. And then his successor, Trevor Quattri, has been a very good market for me too. And so don't shortchange yourself. Don't say, oh, I'm only this kind of writer. Because if you do, you kill some of your opportunities before they can come knocking at your door. And so, you know, give yourself a break and some, and consider what Stan said was very true. My job, ultimately, I, I edit my manuscripts, et cetera, but my job is not to, de to decide whether what I'm writing is gonna be perfect for the magazine or not. That's not my job. I just try to do the best I can, craft my work as well as I can, and hopefully the gods will smile and someone will buy it. And that's that's really helpful. So I have another question about um, uh, sciences in writing, and I'm going to tie this in with a question from Rick in the audience. We've got some great audience questions here. Um, science moves so fast. Um, you know, we're in the era of big data and, and you know, things that just didn't exist before. Um, do you find that it's become more difficult um, to write hard science fiction that doesn't date poorly? As it goes on, as time Our moves forward, never get dates. I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't resist. That. <laughs> no, uh, the, well, yeah. The, the, one of the great challenges in writing science fiction that's not far future. All my stuff has been fairly near future. One of the great challenges with that is the the sell by date. Okay, is the way I think of it. Um, there's there's a there are pluses and minuses with writing near future. The, the plus is you can have an immediate uh, tag into what people are already experiencing. You can warn them a little bit. You can uh, give them a, a what if. Um, the problem is that, you know, you can, you can be left in the dust. Uh, but I, you know, I, I still read novels, the science of which, old, older novels, the science of which I know no longer is au courant, okay? But I still read them if they're good stories and if they say something about, you know, who 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 us people is, 
uh, in this world. And uh, that's 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 why I enjoy that. Um, I've written very little far future. Most of the stuff I've written is usually between, you know, 20, day after tomorrow and the next day. No, between um, about uh, 20 years down line to about 100 or so. Uh, I stay I stay pretty close. Uh, and one of the reasons is because I want to be able to talk directly to what people are already experiencing. Um, but the other is that uh, uh, in in doing that, I feel that um, I have something that uh, can that to say that they're already at some level familiar with. I, they, the question you got to balance it: make it new, but make it something that they can grab onto. Here's a question from Rick in the audience that ties in with that really well. Um, where do you draw the line between hard sci-fi and had wavy, hand wavium to service a story? Oh, I never heard uh, that when I always call it baloney. Become, <laughs> when does the science become rubber science? Um, uh, well, I, I've been very lucky with that because when I was out still touring for my novels, I people would tell uh, scientists would tell me that they couldn't tell where the uh, the real science ended and the rubber science began, and that always made me feel good because I want to work the probable. Okay, I want to work the probable. Um, how do how do I know when it gets uh, when? I've, well, a lot of brilliant science fiction, it has a lot of hand wavium in it. I mean, let's face it, at this point, in the phys with the physics we know, FTL, faster than light travel, is not a thing, okay? And you could argue, Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But you could also say that any magic that's far enough ahead of us uh, in that way, uh, you're not writing science fiction anymore. You're writing a kind of science fantasy. And that's great. I mean, it works. And one of the wonderful things about having FTL is you can basically go anywhere, do anything, have these wonderful, you know, giant galaxy spanning empires. Um, and I, I envy people who do that. But it's it's not my calling. It's not my calling. Um, I want my science to be pretty close. For instance, I've been interested in recent stories uh, with uh, brain computer interfaces, mental decoding, as it's called. And a, a story that's along those lines is one I had a novelette in the September, October issue of Analog. It was called The uh, Apotheosis of Chris Alice Wilson. And that's one of my stories uh, trying to get at that. And I'm fascinated by the idea that, um, that, we know all these things, but we don't know how we know all these things. We still don't understand consciousness. You know, the philosopher Thomas Nagel once asked this wonderful question, what's it like to be a bat? Okay. Not just to imagine you're a bat, to be a bat, to have their sensorium, to have the way they think. And it's, it raises a question not only about bats and animals, but about us. Um, I, I really... It, I don't. I really don't know what's going on in everybody else's head, or sometimes even my own. Um, but one of the things that's miraculous to me, and it's one of the great strengths of language, is that despite the fact that we're all, you know, different life experiences, all these things happening behind our our cranium, despite that, we are able to communicate. We are able to use language to move other people to help them laugh to reach inside. And the fact that we can do that is profoundly amazing to me. Profoundly amazing. But of course, maybe we're more alike than we thought. But I'll I'll dance away from that. I hope that answered Rick's question. It's often baffling that there's a consensus reality at all, right? <laughs> well, is there a consensus reality at all? Yeah. Um, there was a, there's a wonderful item of an old um, Robin Williams album called Reality. What a concept. Um, and, you know, it, it, I do think it's true that because of our perceptual apparatus, we get only a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of all the information, all the reality that's uh, flashing past us. We're only getting a tiny bit of it, but it's what we've got. And we hold tight to it by its smallest tentacle and we don't let it go. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's a challenge. I mean, and I my writing has always been concerned with that the nature of consciousness. Um, and my poetry, in my novels, all of them, they are always concerned with that because it that goes back to that uh, meta question. How do we uh, know what we know and we don't know how we know it? Okay. I love that kind of line. Pretzel logic, they say. Um, and, and if you read a lot of my stuff, you realize that um, I am a chiasmus freak. I love that rhetorical form. I love sentences that are not er one-way arrows. That a chiasmus is a sign of, the, of an arrow of time that goes multiple directions. Okay, so that helped a little bit. Here's another good one from Cliff in the audience. Uh, your hard sci-fi tends to incorporate inspirations from biblical imagery, as you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you find that helps to ground the technology in the human? Oh, okay. Let me give you an example of that. Um, let me see this. And this is this is as, as close to... I, I do... One of the things that I, I'm fascinated by is that Martha, Arthur C. Clarke used to say that ultimately religion and science would prove to be addressing the same thing. Right, let me see if I can find this. Okay, mountain pit. And this is, this is a pretty much straightforward mysticism. I don't know how well grounded it is, Cliff. Um, page 38. And this is the oldest poem in the collection, by the way. I wrote this when my wife, Laurel and I were living in Idlewild in Southern California. Uh, it's called a mountain prayer. O shaper beyond all shapes, who dwells in every shape, with the mellowing geometries of these proud, humble mountains, shape me. O light beyond all lights, who dwells in every light, with the star splash night, with the warm star of day, light my way. O sound beyond all sounds, who dwells in every sound, with the air ocean whisper of the high pine wind resound in me. O teacher beyond all teachers who dwells in all that teaches, teach me the truths of forever to be seen in a single day. Teach me your high, hard way. That's as close to mystical as I get, I suppose. But yeah, it's, I, I, I do find that trying to root, at some level, a friend of mine, Art, Art, Art Holcomb, who's, I see his, uh, window there um, says that stories are emotion deliver delivery systems, and they are, they are. Um, but I'm always trying to, to push the the source of emotion toward awe, and sometimes I make it, and sometimes I don't. Okay, I hope that helps. Any other questions? Yeah, two more. We're getting towards the end of the hour here. It's just flown yeah. by, but a um, couple more things I want to ask. Uh, switching gears just a little bit here. Um, on top of being a writer of Poetry, fiction, nonfiction, you seem to have done it all. Um, you've also worked quite a bit as an editor. What yeah. has your work as an editor taught you about writing fiction and poetry? Okay. Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, and remember, there's two different variants of the editor, the editor world that I was in, engaged in. I was an editor of uh, you know, uh, science fiction criticism. Uh, I cut several books, you know, put out by McFarlane and company. Uh, I was an editor, co-editor on, and that they, they, that's editing usually with folks who are very skilled writers and you're just trying to shape things and make their manuscript look as, be as helpful as possible. And remember that, a uh, an idea isn't good unless it's expressed well. Um, and that's on the one hand, on the other hand, for close to 40 years, I taught writing and literature, and I taught a heck of a lot of composition courses, tons and tons and tons and tons of them. So that was a much more basic, work your way through the sentence, understand what, what language can do. And that's a very different type of editing. But both of them have contributed to trying to, you know, make me a little bit more concise, a little more succinct. Um, because I, you know, I, 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 have, I am a... Uh, I, I do love to just go on and explore explore ideas, and I've got to keep myself tying people into that. And that's great about poetry; you can it doesn't require much time. 
And you would do these wonderful big ideas and have them speak to people in a very quick way. That's wonderful. In longer pieces, if you wander off too far into the research weeds, you lose them. And that's always a challenge. Um, so the more that I'm forced to actually try to, the you know, power to weight ratio, say as much as possible, it's, say it in as many words as it needs and no more. And that's, that's really my goal. And poetry helps me get there. And also writing flash fiction helps me get there. Um, but I'm still writing longer pieces. And I'm hoping that that experience writing flash and poetry will also turn into something that makes me a better writer at whatever length. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so here's the last question. And if you want to close us out with a poem afterwards, that would be wonderful. Um, what are you currently working on? Uh, and what's coming up next for you? Okay, I've got a bunch of stuff that's currently in the pipeline at Analog, um, including two flash fiction pieces. Uh, I have just signed a contract with McFarland and Company uh, to, and you know, I've worked for them before, to produce a 75,000 word manuscript on living fossils, lost worlds, last humans. And of course it's an academic-ish book, so it's got a colon. The subtitle is The Science and Fiction of Population and Extinction. It's a it, it's going to kill me. I hope it doesn't, but that's it. That's the, the current big project. It's due end of June, uh, 2025. So that's what I'm up to, but I'm, you know, I, I, I that's my main focus, uh, but I, I, I never stop writing poetry and I always am trying to write, uh, uh, some more, uh, shorter fiction, uh, for many, many years I taught and I'm going to end this up real quick. For many, many years I taught, and that meant the only time I could really write, have enough time to work on longer projects was in the summer. And then we moved up to the mountains and I got very involved with my local neighborhood and uh, didn't have much time in the summer either. Since my house burned down and I retired, my house burned down three weeks after I retired. Since that happened, I've got plenty of time. We did move to Colorado, okay? I used to oversee 12 acres of land. I oversee one twelfth of an acre now. And so I have a lot more time and that's been wonderful because I've, I've been able to devote, devote more of my time to writing. Something I've waited for all my life. There you go. Well, that's excellent. I know uh, most of us can't wait for, for what comes next. And this book sounds pretty fascinating. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Howard, for, for sharing your work with us. Um, I, I'd love it if you close this out with a poem. But before, I just want to let everybody know there is a link in the chat to where you can get this wonderful book. Um, also, I think any fan of speculative poetry will be interested in our next event, which is coming up February 6th. It's going to be an interview and reading with Mary Soon Lee. Um, so please join us for that, too. Who is a wonderful writer. OK, a wonderful writer. Um, I'm a big fan of hers. OK, I'll give you one last poem to focus on. There's so many in here. Okay. Okay. I, uh, this one's called Felling Cedars, which is something I used to do in the mountains. That's page 25. Felling Cedars. Pink blood overflows the bar oil reservoir. The gas oil mix tank is black eye full. The saw chain, teeth sharp enough to catch and cut, must be tight, but not too tight, on the cutting bar. I am careful of my hands. With a screwdriver, I tighten the tank caps into place. I grip and yank the pull cord until the engine grumbles to life. Biting into the trunk, the saw spits out a plume of cedar shavings like a classroom's worth of pencils all run through the sharpener at once. The gibbous moon of wood, the saw chews out, a Humboldt cut, makes a toothless pumpkin smile on the side where I want the tree to fall. Coming round behind the trunk, biting the saw in on a line, even with the top lip of that lipless smile, I am too aware the idiot machine will chew flesh and bone as soon as bark and heartwood. My head conjures hot, dark scarlet of extremities severing, torment of hand or foot already lost, pain of phantom limb 
stump hallucination, map in the brain insisting the country of the lost hand is still there despite all the eyes denials. My free and still intact gloved hand pushes on the trunk that's now almost cut through. I lean into it, sending the cedar creaking over, falling through the air with a whoosh of branches, hitting ground with a thudding crash, severing its limbs for slash, sawing the trunk to stove lengths for drying and splitting. I stare a moment at the abandoned tree stump. As it dies, does it hallucinate trunk and limbs and green solar needles, all still shining in the tall wind? Then I know both feller and tree may fall victim to the steel tooth machine, but only the tree will be innocent. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Howard Thank B. You. Hendricks, time. Living Fossils are the Happiest Kind. If you're watching on YouTube, you can get the book at the link down below. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night, all. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. <laughs>